Hello again, witches, seekers, and friends, and thanks for tuning in to episode 30 of the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast. I'm your host, Paige, the Fat Feminist Witch, and today I'll be talking about basic witches, sluts, feminists, and people who just straight up hate fun. This is a witch and bitch episode, which means I've also taken a poll from witches online around the world about one of today's topics. Do you have to practice magic to be a witch? Hello everyone and welcome to March. For those of us who don't thrive in the snow like a Norwegian forest cat, March is the time we all start losing our patience just a little bit and cursing whatever goddess is in charge of the March seasonal flip-flop. It's been spring four times already since New Year's here and, you know, immediately went back to winter and I'm so not really a fan. Like I'm (laughs) really starting to get a little bit loopy. But I'm really excited about today's topic. So today's topic is slightly controversial, and I mean that. The controversy controversy surrounding it is very, very slight. So when someone in my witch and bitch group for my, my Patreon people suggested we read something slightly controversial as a group, I immediately thought of the brand new book Basic Witches by Jaya Saxena and Jess Zimmerman. Not only is it not a super serious controversy, so it's a really good place to start. (laughs) Uh, I've been excited about this book since I heard about it for the first time. Uh, Jaya Saxena interviewed me, oh my goodness, more than a year ago now, during the Brock Turner hexing, uh, about hexing and healing through hexing work. And I got a lot of responses to that that were incredibly complimentary. And a few people even said, that that article in the Daily Dot, that interview, was one of the most witch-positive articles that they've ever read. And they were very, very impressed. So I went in to this book and this situation with a bit of a positive bias. I'll, I'll admit that. But let's back up just a little bit. Today I'm talking about what being a witch means, who gets to call themselves that, and who gets to decide who calls themselves that. <laughs> uh, there are, in fact, people who take on the label of witch, despite not being pagans or magical practitioners, right? Witchiness is very, very trendy right now. And you see people from, you know, free-spirited young teens up to dope older women who are just too fashionable, dressing as a witch and channeling their own inner witch. There are lots of folks who have practiced their own witchcraft or paganism or pagan religion for a long time and find this trendy version of witchcraft to be a cheap imitation or maybe even an affront to their genuine, you know, religious beliefs. I hesitate to use a word like cultural appropriation when it comes to, I don't know, I guess appropriating a religious practice, especially this one that is still, still uh, very much practiced by white people, Uh, but it at least gives you the gist of this, this issue and what these people are feeling. So many real witches, real with a lot of exclamation points, because I don't like to say whether or not anything is real, because what the hell do I know? (laughs) My reality is very different from a lot of other people's, and I've learned that. So many real witches who've suffered for their rights and for their craft and their rights to practice their craft, see this kind of commercialized interpretation of that craft And don't see anyone having to do the hard work or fighting or, you know, studying ancient Latin texts or accidentally summoning Aleister Crowley's favorite demon or whatever. And they feel that it's watering down their own beliefs or that their religion is even being made fun of. This topic was inspired by the book Basic Witches, like I said. And when this book came out, I saw a lot of established witches and pagans Instantly going, oh no, got to put a stop to this right now. This is another fluffy bunny witch book that is going to be making fun of my witchcraft and it's not even real witchcraft and etc, etc. Right in the beginning of the book, this controversy starts uh, and it because it defines witchcraft like this. In this book, witchcraft doesn't mean occult or religious practices that historical witches may or may not have engaged in, nor does it mean the religious practice that is a sacred tradition for many people worldwide. For our purposes, witchcraft means the kind of mundane pursuits that might once have resulted in accusation, enjoying sex, controlling reproductive health, hanging out with other women, not caring what men think, disagreeing, and just knowing stuff. Later on in a section about the authors themselves, it even says that Jess Zimmerman is a lifelong atheist and doesn't believe in mysticism or the occult. And this is exactly where a few people started kind of losing their shit, so to speak. Even I right away had to stop and ask myself, well, wait, are you really a witch if you don't believe in magic or practice, you know, occult arts? Not only, And I realize that not only do I not have a straight answer for this, 
but that I was immediately assuming that I even get to define that. Who died and made me queen of the witches? No one yet. So I saw a few reviews that said this was the point which people gave up on the book, they didn't finish, or they just decided that the rest would be fluff. And if they had kept reading, they would have had the same experience I did. The further into the book I got, the more I realized how new it is to both be a witch or be considered a witch and actually practice magic. When I went to Salem a few years ago, which I talked about in another episode called uh, Witchy Wandering, I think. It was like the second one. So I toured through the witch house. No witches ever lived in the witch house, but a judge, Judge Corwin, in the witch trials in Salem in 1692, did live there. And it's the only house still standing from that time related to the whole hubbub. Uh, as I was touring through, I, I mean, first of all, it's this beautiful, very old home. Um, but I saw a lot of things that really made me chuckle. Uh, there was a giant cauldron in this gorgeous, you know, those old stone fireplaces that you could walk up under. Uh, there was a giant cauldron hanging there. There were herbs hanging to dry from walls and ceilings and windows. There were bottles, you know, labeled as natural remedies. And there were books and charts about astrology. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> this guy was supposed to hunt witches. What is he doing with all this witchcraft shit? Uh, this stuff is witchcraft now. But this wasn't always witchcraft. And in fact, throughout history, you could harvest herbs and make spooky potions with shady medical claims in your cauldron according to the position of the stars and also be firmly anti-witch, super uh, Catholic or Christian, and send a handful of witches to die. You could do all those things because that wasn't witchcraft back then. That was medicine. That was science. And oh, oh, if that crappy Judge Corwin could see his precious, legitimate, godly sciences and medicines being used for hexing rapists now. Oh, it just gives me so much joy. <laughs> so much joy. I firmly recommend touring the witch house if you go to Salem and are a witch because you will just, oh, it'll, it'll fortify your heart just a little bit. So the fact is that what is and is not witchcraft has changed over and over throughout time and is even still different all over the world. In some places, it's still legal to be a witch and you can be executed for perceived witchcraft practices. In others, it's part of a protected religion. Even if you yourself are not a religious witch, like me, if you're a secular witch, my witchcraft practices as a spiritual practice are still protected here in Canada. So it's, witch means something different even still. The book includes, Basic Witches includes regular blurbs about the history of witchcraft and culture and the people who practiced it or didn't actually practice it and how that was then twisted into something evil or illegal or a reason to even execute them. Really, really great. I could not stop comparing it to another book that I read recently and absolutely like loved. I think in my review I described it as, you know how there's that one book where you could give it to someone and be like, this is literally me. Once you read this, you'll know who I am. It's Witches, Sluts, Feminist by Christian J. Soleil for me. That is my book. It, it explains my whole, my whole being, my whole situation. It explains the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast. It's everything. All in one tiny, adorable book with a beautiful cover that I just love. Witches, Sluts, Feminists and Basic Witches. Both talk more, like Witches, Sluts, Feminists, Basic Witches talks more about the history of people who have either had the label of witch applied to them, or the people who chose that label as a mantle of power and strength, than it does paganism or Wicca or any religion. The two books even used a lot of the same reference sources. One of these is Witches, Midwives, and Nurses, which I just cannot recommend enough. I'm actually going to have to do a whole other episode about witches, uh, yeah, witches, midwives, and nurses, because I got that book back in 2009. It's a pamphlet, actually, from the 1970s. I got it as part of my doula course back in 2009, and that is a, a little pamphlet or book that I've gone back to over and over and over, even though I'm not interested in being a doula. It was part of what really got me interested in... <sighs> What kinds of people, what kinds of women especially, 
have been witches throughout time, what does being a witch actually mean? And that book is just an amazing place to start. So I highly recommend <laughs> Witches, Midwives, Nurses, which basic witches and witches slut feminists both reference and that's new. <laughs> this book's been out, like I said, since the 70s, but it's new to have it referenced in witch books. So I was very impressed to see that in both. Both included sex positive witch history and practice. And which is Sluts Feminist, the tagline is even conjuring the sex positive, which I totally love. And both were non-judgmental and a totally secular representation of witchcraft. So what's the difference between basic witches and which is sluts feminist other than you know obviously who wrote it in, <laughs> in its general format um which is sluts feminist is getting exactly as much praise as it deserves it's doing really well which is a non which is alike love which is sluts feminist basic witches is not getting the same kind of traction and i have a theory <laughs> uh, it might be a conspiracy theory but i have a theory um <laughs> as far as I can tell, the main difference, uh, aside from the fact that Basic Witches does feature spells and correspondences and things like that, which Witches Let's Feminist does not, other than that, um, Basic Witches reads as being more for teens or people in their very early witchy stages. Even people who are just interested in, you know, feminism and the modern feminist movement for the first time. It's definitely written for people who have not been witches for a while. I genuinely believe the fact that it reads as very appropriate for young people is getting it labeled as juvenile or fluffy or, you know, like whatever. And I resent that. I totally resent that. People got to stop saying that everything that teens, especially teen girls or, or feminine teen people, People gotta stop saying that all the stuff they like is stupid or silly or that it's not real or that, you know, you'll grow up and find something good for grown ups soon. Stop that. You can flip to any news channel right now and see teens, especially teen girls, standing up and claiming their power and saying, fuck no. Fuck no. Right on TV. <laughs> teens and young witches have so much power and energy and I am just relishing in this crop of badass children looking to change the world. They're not just looking at it. They're doing it. How many teen girls have you seen stand up and call out Trump publicly, call out, you know, gun reform, the lack of education for women and anything, <laughs> anything. Stop saying that the stuff that teens, teen girls especially are into is just not real or it's juvenile or it's fluffy or it's got no value because it does. Those kids are a lot smarter and tougher than people will give them credit for. People refuse to give them credit. So here's the difference. If I had a young child or niece or nephew or whomever come to me and ask me how they can get started understanding and trying witchcraft in the way that I practice witchcraft with a combination of social issues and feminism, the first book I'd give them, Basic Witches, 100%. If they came to me later as an older person or more established, I'd definitely give them Witches, Sluts, Feminists as a next natural step. For someone who's been a magical practitioner for a really long time and are just trying to incorporate, incorporate the feminism or the social issues into their practice or trying to figure out how the witch became part of this social image, I'd give them Witches, Sluts, Feminists because they don't need the basic ma actual magical practice of basic witches. Either way, what you're getting from these books is a modern, totally secular and non-judgmental take on what witchcraft is right now and what you can accomplish in your life by wielding its power. That's it. Both books offer this really great image of what witchcraft is right now. And I think that's important. I think that's really important, especially when you consider... <laughs> What maybe witchcraft looked like, especially according to some of the books, when you were just starting out. I happen to have gotten started in a really hilarious time in witchcraft that is similar to right now, where the witch became kind of a social icon, but in more of a silly way. Even more so than some of the fun, silly stuff in Basic Witches. You know, you have Charmed and it's just, we went from being scary to being a joke. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> so I, I throughout the book, I often imagined what it would have been like for me to find this book when I was young and starting out. It would have been really nice. <laughs> uh, so before I posted my review of the book, and before I even say it now, I wanted to get some comments from some people out there in the blogosphere. Uh, what makes someone a witch? What magic even is? And, and thoughts about the book. I ask people to respond right on my social media posts or the blog, or to use the hashtag witch and bitch across social everywhere. And these are some of my favorite responses to my question. Do you have to practice magic to be a witch? So Mizuno Megami on Instagram uh, left the first comment, and I really liked it right away. I would argue you're a non-practicing witch at the time you are not actively studying or conducting magical ritual. Little magic is as easy as cutlery or incense or herbs at some points. I've also gone through huge chunks of time, university, where I didn't even think about my spirituality. Now I have the time and energy, but I never stopped being a witch, not since I was 16. And those are my thoughts. I liked this comment right away because I related to it strongly. When I first started this podcast, I made a joke that for a long time, I've been a lazy witch that did not do a lot of practicing. And that's the truth. Years went by, although for me, it was in high school, <laughs> where I didn't even think about my spirituality and think about witchcraft and think about paganism. There were a few years in my early adulthood where I didn't have witch friends. I didn't do any witch stuff. I didn't even really read my witch books, nothing. But looking back, I still consider myself being a witch around that time. I just wasn't currently practicing or engaging with my spirituality. So I think that's really important because you can be a witch while you're not practicing as long as that is something that you feel and that you have claimed for yourself. And I think that's a really great definition here. Um, Kai the Kiwi said, if you don't have any interest in practicing any magic ever, even little magics like collecting nature trinkets, paying attention to signs, or other little traditions or superstitions, I would be on the side of saying that that's not a witch. But if you have an interest and pay attention to your witchy spirituality, but don't practice magic, then I would call that a non-practicing witch. And then further, if you do any witchcrafting, even if it's teeny tiny, then you're a practicing witch. It doesn't have to be full on rituals or spells. I love this comment because... First of all, it's very non-judgmental. It's open. It's like, you know, just do what you want. There's a smiley face in there. It doesn't have to be full on rituals, but it still shows that there, for a lot of people, are different milestones. They're, they're different mile markers of witchcraft and of spirituality. And, and the definition of witch changes all the time, even within the one person. As far as using the term, uh, quite a few people told me that they don't really care if people call themselves a witch. So co-op of creation on Instagram again said, I think you can call yourself whatever you like. If you feel like the title or sentiment fits you, then it's yours. It doesn't hurt anyone else. And I really, really like that. Uh, Ruby Bright expanded on that said, I agree that a person can call themselves whatever they like. However, it is disrespectful to witches to call yourself a witch without showing some fundamental witchy values. As earlier commenters noted, some witchy values are herb usage, uh, moon and nature association, etc. Also essential in my mind are the study and usage of archetypes, symbols, and ancestral rituals, and belief in core concepts such as the rule of three, as above, so below, and the sacredness of all things. Clearly, the primacy of these values in one's life will ebb and flow. Calling oneself a witch without attention to them at all would be like calling oneself a Christian without believing in one God and the resurrection of Christ. You could do it, but you'd be wrong. I liked this comment because I don't agree with it. <laughs> um, this part, this part, Maruby says, also essential in my mind are belief in core concepts such as the rule of three. Yeah, I don't believe that. I don't believe in the rule of three. <laughs> ah, I'm still a witch for sure. I'm not, you know, I'm not attacking you, Ruby. I really did still appreciate uh, this comment. I really liked it because it shows how everybody's, everybody's definition of witch is different and it's based on different things, different mile markers. Uh, for this person, if you don't ascribe to core beliefs from Wicca, because that's where the rule of three came from, it's from Wicca, then you're not really practicing witchcraft. And that's totally their right to think that, you know, it's, it's totally their right to think that. It's their right to think whatever they want. 
But this is not what everyone believes. And this is something I cannot say that I believe in. Um, I really liked this one by Witchcraft Coven, again on Instagram. So they said, Dep- depends what you define as practicing and magic. Some people might suggest that we are made of the essence of the stars and that every tiny act we perform and every syllable that we utter is by definition magic. When you hate someone in your heart, you are creating a curse. When you speak truth and love, you weave magic into the hearts of others. Your gentle hands heal. And sometimes you need to curse someone who is causing problems. And punching them in the jaw is a good way to curse them. Example, Nazis. I don't believe in the rule of three for Nazis. (laughs) I've been saying I don't believe in the rule of three for Nazis in my own head to myself and chuckling like <laughs> like all morning. I absolutely love that. It's very poetic. It's beautiful. So you should check out Witchcraft coming on, on Instagram for sure. And I like this because it, uh, and this is an idea that came up in a few different comments that I got, is that sometimes witchcraft is, is innate and it just, it comes from us. And that being alive and being human and sharing in this human experience is magical. And everything you do is magic and it affects everybody. And I like that. There's a lot of times where I'm not specifically trying to practice magic, but my energy or my emotions or whatever, just they just got to get the hell out. They got to get out. And I end up casting some magic that I really didn't mean to. It happens. It totally happens. And if you can cast magic accidentally, (laughs) then why do you have to be specifically practicing on purpose for that to be, for you to be a witch? How can both of those exist, right? Another comment that I totally loved, and this is one, I'm going to share a few comments that that shared the sentiment. I think one of the things that makes a witch is total freedom to do as he or she pleases without answering to anyone. This is from energy of everything on Instagram. So if you do, you do. And if you don't, you don't. I think it's about what's happening in your head. Once your mind has been opened, there is no closing it. I really liked that. And that changes you. You become something else. And that's what I think makes a witch. Even if she or he calls themselves one or not, there are many people out there who do not think of themselves as witches, but because of what they understand and believe, they are witches. And I I absolutely loved that. It's the total freedom to do as he or she pleases without answering to anyone. And I like the part about once your mind has been opened, there is no closing it. I firmly believe that there are people out there who don't think they're witches, don't call themselves witches, but because of things that they've been through or experienced or because of their beliefs, like like energy of everything said, they are a magical person with maybe just a magical vibe or energy. They're casting magic all over the place not on purpose, just because it is coming from them. Because once you open your mind, there is no closing it. (laughs) You can't just shut magic off sometimes. And that is an idea and a sentiment that showed up in a lot of the comments and conversations that I had about this. Um, One of my favorite, favorite, favorite comments came from right on the blog, right on the post, uh, witchy basic, because I've been watching just a little bit too much good place lately. Um, Nicole says, as someone who attends a very liberal university, I have noticed the word witch become extremely popular among the many women that I know. Often it is a term not used to denote religious or spiritual beliefs, but rather an identity of fuck the patriarchy. I'm a strong, independent woman, which is an awesome identity to have. This is something that I've been thinking about lately, as I see my own spirituality and practice become a commercial trend at stores like Urban Outfitters and Free People. I'll admit, I'm torn. On one hand, there's a part of me that believes claiming you're a witch for simply owning a crystal is like claiming to be Christian because you own a cross necklace. Adopting the term witch, due to its current trendiness, likewise seems to be adopting an identity while ignoring the history of intolerance toward practitioners. But that being said, I have to remind myself that the thousands burned on accusations of witchcraft in the in early modern Europe were rarely identified as actual witches themselves. Yeah, that's what I said too, Nicole. 
Thanks. Uh, she goes on to say, with this in mind, I have to ask what counts as witchcraft. And isn't imposing strict rules inherently contradictory to the nature of the craft itself? People choose this practice for many reasons, but one reason I hear over and over and over again is the desire to break free from the structure of organized religion. If we start creating strict rules for what type of witchcraft counts, we run the risk of falling into the same pattern. In addition, to disregard a witch for being an atheist becomes a slippery slope. Not all witches are pagan. There is a long tradition of witchcraft that exists in Christian countries such as Romania, and practices such as voodoo and santeria often involve the blending of pre-colonial African faiths and Catholicism. That also brings in the issue of race and prejudice against the practices of marginalized groups, which you delved into beautifully in the last witch and bitch. Oh, thanks, Nicole. And I loved this comment, first of all, because it's like, it's like super smart and eloquent. Like, <laughs> this is all the stuff that I was saying, but like, written by someone who's a good writer. So this really just like was strumming my pain with its fingers, which is an expression I've been using way too much because I love Lauren Hill. But <laughs> this this comment really said everything that I've been thinking. First of all, that witchcraft has changed and most of the people that were burned or hung or executed on charges of witchcraft were not actually witches. And the stuff they did wasn't witchcraft. And the people that were killing them did practice stuff that is now witchcraft. <laughs> That's something I had to think about and I had to notice. Um, I definitely think that witch is a very powerful and positive term and identity that a lot of people are taking on. And I firmly believe that it can help a lot of people. Another thing that came up during Basic Witches is the, is witch, the organization. The Witches International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell, which was a, you know, a protest group. It was a protest group. It was a social issues group, a feminist group. And it's it's become reborn and it's becoming popular again. You have the, the witched protesters in their full witch garb, you know, the black hat, and black everything. And they look very striking. Those people, a lot of them are absolutely not religious practicing witches. Witchcraft isn't part of their religion or their spirituality at all. But witchcraft is a powerful icon that they can use to enact social change. And I consider that witchcraft. <laughs> I totally consider that witchcraft. Which, again, is another concept that came up both in Basic Witches and in Witches, Sluts, Feminists. Because it has such a noticeable, such a obvious tie to the cliche images of witch and the power of witchcraft some of which wasn't real it was you know the imagined power of witchcraft protests in general are a time to find a lot of witches witches that maybe don't practice witchcraft uh, a lot of members of the satanic temple which are just i mean even if you're not a Satanist, I'm not a Satanist, but even if you're not a Satanist, you got to check out some of the stuff that the Satanic Temple is doing. You can follow them on, on Twitter and Instagram. Check out their their protests. Read everything you can. Like all of the news things about them. Totally interesting. The Satanic Temple is using, you know, this imagery that we kind of associate with Satanism, you know, heavy metal and black and witches and the devil into their fairly non-theistic uh, faith <laughs> uh, belief system. Let's go with that. Their belief system. I'm not sure if they're an organized religion. They might be. I'm not sure. Um, so I'm not going to say that. But into their faith system, they are they are really... I completely forget what I just said. <laughs> so the Satanic Temple is using a lot of this imagery... Uh, and working it in with their, their faith belief type system thing to highlight a lot of social issues and to show off just how kind of silly and absurd a lot of the extremist arguments on the other sides of religions, like usually Abrahamic religions, how absurd some of those um, issues, beliefs, uh, oppressive actions, how absurd some of that can really be when you apply it to uh, 
a religion or a faith-based system that a lot of people consider, first of all, just not real. <laughs> uh, witches, to a lot of people, are still just a fictional character. Um, and also that is so uh, supposedly strikingly contrary to the the sort of lax Christian ideal. I'm trying super hard not to be offensive. Can you guys tell that I'm like struggling a little bit? They're using imagery of witches and of um, biblical stories that are definitely not as like inspirational as a lot of people thought. And, uh, and especially of witches, witchcraft, uh, demonology, all of that stuff to, again, enact social change, to point out how absurd it is to think that one religion or one set of religious beliefs could be the norm for absolutely everybody and that it absolutely 100% makes sense every single time. And again, this is something that I consider to be fucking witchcraft. <laughs> I love all the stuff that the Satanic Temple is doing right now. I'm not a Satanist, but I follow like a ton of them on Twitter and I read every single news thing I see about them, have to see what the writer is going to say about these satanic people. Because I just, <laughs> I just think that they're doing something really, really amazing, really, really interesting. And they are using the mantle, the image, the archetype of witch and witchcraft to do something not just for witches. And I really like that. It's furthering the whole, you know, cool witchcraft vibe where we wear all black and are otherworldly and vaguely threatening. And I, I respect that. I respect that. Um, I want to read uh, one more comment here from Yena on the blog again. I believe this is a good place for debate, but I'm not sure how to answer the question. I just finished reading a feminist book on the history of witches oriented around the history of medicine. Oh, my God. I bet that was witches, midwives, and nurses. <laughs> I'm going to have to respond and ask because I bet this person is reading Witches, Midwives, and Nurses. And the one focus there was on witches, uh, that it was invented by men who had an agenda uh, for the women in society who didn't like female healers, uh, self-taught women, and most probably free spirits. The thing is that we can't ignore the fact that the word witch and what it means was first invented by Christians to scare the population and kill every woman who didn't follow the church orders, basically. So in that sense, I understand the view of people who wrote the book, reclaiming the word and something close to its original meaning to say, I have control over my body and mind, and I'm free to be who I want to be. I think that's great, especially from a feminist point of view. I very much agree with that, by the way, as Paige here. <laughs> Back to the comment. On the other hand, witchcraft means something else for a lot of people today, and I feel it wouldn't make sense to say you can be a witch without practicing. For example, you can't buy crystals for their meaning but do nothing with it at all, nothing spiritual in any form, and say you are a witch because you have crystals. It just doesn't work with the spiritual definition of witchcraft. It's like saying you are a yogi because that one time you did a tree position and posted it on Instagram. I love this comment a lot, especially because, I mean, the first half of the comment is 100%. Totally, like, this is everything that I've been talking about here. Um, the definition of witch has changed so many times that who's to say that there isn't value in claiming that that archetype and that iconic image, even though you're not practicing, you know, what most people consider to be magic. And the next point here is that some witchcraft is totally fake. You can't buy crystals for their meaning, but do nothing with it at all. Nothing spiritual in any form and say you are a witch because you have crystals. I don't think everyone who has crystals and is new to it is faking it. I don't think everyone who posts their, you know, their tree pose or their, their aesthetically pleasing witchy stuff on Instagram is faking it. I just don't. Uh, first of all, I don't fucking know them. Like, how am I supposed to know if they're faking it? That's crazy. I can't just make assumptions like that. But there really is some sense in this. When does it stop being... Yeah, yeah, witchcraft is for everyone. Everyone's welcome and everyone can be helped with this. When does it cross the line from going from there to when are you kind of appropriating from actual witchcraft? And uh, Ravenly writes here on the blog, they actually, <laughs> I got a lot of different comments from Ravenly and I was really excited. It was like, Oh, I commented on the blog, but here I got something else to say on Twitter. Or, oh man, I just said that on Twitter, but I, here's something else on Instagram because I just I just thought of it. 
it's really great because them and their partner were answering and being like, oh, you know what? That thing we just said, maybe we don't really believe believe that so much. Maybe it's more like this. And it shows how tricky of a topic and a question that this can be really be. Raven Lee said, the first thing that jumped out at me was actually the use of the word coven. Like, witch has been really used and abused as a concept, but when you pair witch with coven, it really starts to lean in a magical direction for me. What does a coven do if not practice witchcraft? Granted, I've not read the book, so I assume it's answered therein. But that's a real sticking point for me. Reclaiming witch in a non-magical way is one thing, but taking witch and coven and whatever else without taking the rest of it seems weird to me. I would love to know what they feel they get out of it. Um, and this was great. Now, coven was not the thing that made me have this reaction, but I did absolutely have this reaction while I was reading the book. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is something I did talk about in the last Witch and Bitch episode. Uh, episode 21, How White Witches Talk About Black Magic. The linguistic implications of white magic and black magic are just glaringly icky. <laughs> uh, it also kind of has a slightly judgmental tone, even though curses do appear in Basic Witches. Uh, there's a section on demons and daemons. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, 120 something pages in, this, these definitions of white and black magic that aren't quite right just popped in. <sighs> it became, it, this is one of those moments where I just felt a little itchy and like, oh, I wish you'd gotten, I wish you'd gotten a real witch to, to proofread this and it, to tell you if that's chill or not. It just felt like they were working some cliche witch lingo into an otherwise pretty decent chapter, you know, about what, how to say that you don't want to have sex, things like that. It felt like they were just doing it to fit the aesthetic of the book, and I didn't really dig it. And that's the point when I started to really see that issue for people. Um, being a witch is one thing, but once you're taking, like, the more further things, like, Covens are kind of a serious spiritual issue for witches, especially because covens are like notoriously hard to find and create. Notoriously hard. It's like creating your own church congregation without a physical structure or, you know, a, 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 like an overarching religion or something. Like it's really, really difficult to find and make a real witch coven. And white versus black magic that's just something about witchcraft that i think can totally fade away to describe good things as white and bad things as black is just so it's just so obviously uh one of those things in our language with very racist undertones and i just i don't think i really need it so at a certain point i did really feel like oh you don't get to do that though <laughs> So, so I still had that moment for sure. Uh, and, and Raven Lee's comment just put how I felt there into a very nice kind of succinct comment there. Um, and, and I do, I do somewhat agree. I do somewhat agree with that, which is why the book, and you can read the full review, uh, on fatfeministwitch.com later today. The book got four out of five crystal balls. Now, four out of five crystal balls is still an awesome rating. What four out of five crystal balls means is that yes, I liked the book. I love the book. I plan to keep the book and I can even see myself using stuff from the book later in life. It's not something that I absolutely need to survive, <laughs> which is what which slut feminist is. That's my five star. But yeah, this is, this is a fantastic book, Basic Witches. The first read through, I thought I would end up giving it three crystal balls out of four because I couldn't see myself really going back and using it. You know, I got a little too big for my britches thinking I'm a, I'm a badass witch and I don't really need this basic witch shit, but that's not the truth. I, I went back through it and maybe you guys can actually hear this, but these are all the little pink, like hot pink tabs that are sticking, sticking outside of basic witches now. Like I can't even count them looking at it. It's like 20 or 30. There's no less than four or five spells in this book that I'm definitely going to be trying like before the end of the month because I thought they were so useful and so relatable, so easy. There were almost no ingredients in this book that I cannot get a hold of, that anyone cannot get a hold of. 
And that's something I really, really liked. A lot of people, a lot of bloggers <laughs> wrote reviews of the book or were talking about the book, wrote topics about the book without even reading the book. And they claimed that the book was this this capitalist swill. It was the capitalization of witchcraft. And it was just, you know, it's these non-witches trying to make money off of witches and, you know, how that's shit. I'm trying to sell you Instagram witchcraft stuff. I don't know. But that's not what I found in here at all. This is so not what the book is like. And when people say that, just go ahead and assume right away that they have not read it. Uh, especially if they call it white bullshit or the Taylor Swift of witchcraft. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that the, that's just not the way it actually comes off. So the artwork, the language, and the types of spells that you get in Basic Witches are really inclusive and incredibly relatable. Uh, there are all different types of spells in there. Some that don't use any stuff or tools at all, let alone anything expensive. Uh, and the tools and things you need are almost exclusively already in your home or a local everyday type of store. Like half the shit you can get at dollar stores. There aren't any brands mentioned. They don't tell you to spend money on getting the perfect set of witch tools and the perfect altar setup. There's no outlandish herbs or rare crystals. Uh, you could covertly buy any of the spell ingredients without setting off alarm bells if you are not someone who is a public witch. And I think that's still important for new witches. Uh, these are some of the best spells that I've found in a basic witch book for actual new witches that, that don't necessarily have, you know, an herbalist in town like I do and, you know, don't have a witch store where they can go pick out crystals. They just have to grab stuff online or they can't let someone see it. That's not capitalist will. That's like, that's necessary. Um, I kept thinking all through basic witches, what would it have been like if when I was young and I was discovering witchcraft and also, you know, my own values, what would have happened if I had found a book just like Basic Witches? And I thought this because <laughs> I definitely have the Basic Witches of the year 2000. This book is called Five Easy Steps to Becoming a Witch. Yeah, yeah. It's a hardcover book and I've lost the dust jacket, but I'm, I'm firmly, I remember it was hot pink and bright purple and it had silver metallic stars and crap all over it. This tiny book is pocket-sized. It's like, it's almost exactly the same size as Basic Witches. Basic Witches is like an inch and a half taller, which makes me laugh. The inside aesthetically is, it's all purple. <laughs> it's purple everywhere. There are fun fonts. There are really cool drawings and artwork of witches and witches of all different genders and stuff. They're very like gender non-specific witches all throughout this book. And it's cheesy swell. You, you'd be hard pressed <laughs> to find a real witch, witch that's like, oh yeah, one of my favorite books is uh, Five Easy Steps to Becoming a Witch. I use it all the time. Hard pressed to find that. This book considered trash. It's totally considered trash. But I've used it so much that pages are falling out. It's dog-eared. I've lost the dust jacket. There are, uh, <laughs> there is gold glitter gel pen <laughs> everywhere because I made notes. And uh, there is even some stuff highlighted with a real highlighter. That's not something I do in books unless I absolutely have to. The thing I highlighted, by the way, is, um, <laughs> signs that someone might be a witch in old times. They had to, you know, during the Salem witch trials, they would do physical examinations and you could have physical signs of witchcraft. And one of these would be uh, having a sixth finger. I was born with an extra finger on each hand. I, I realize, I never realized that if you guys don't know me and haven't seen me in person, you guys wouldn't know this. I was born with an extra finger on six, uh, an extra finger on each hand. And that has always been like my own fun little like, yeah, I was definitely born a witch. And seeing this in this book always made me smile. But I bought this book 18 years ago, right when it came out. Uh, it's cheesy. It's ridiculous. It combines cultures and things in a way that barely ties together, barely makes sense. And yet I've used it a million times. Half the stuff in this book has been copied directly into old books of shadows that I've had. I think people are very quick to disregard something like Five Easy Steps to Becoming a Witch or Basic Witches 
because it's pretty, it's cute. It's marketed towards young people. And it's not as scary and serious, you know. (laughs) Witchcraft and magic doesn't always have to be serious. You can totally have fun with it and that can still be real. And I think Basic Witches is a really great example of that in modern times. A really great example of that. I don't think your witchcraft books have to be super, super serious. A lot of my favorite witch books, the stuff that has set my soul on fire in the last 10 years, is stuff where there are, you know, personal stories all the way through it and jokes. And maybe there are little sketches and things like that. Uh, I always loved Tess Whitehurst books. Every time I've talked about that with other people, we love to talk about Ted her boyfriend who comes up and it's just this, Ted is a non-witch and it's, it's just funny to talk about Ted as like an archetype. And I love stories about Ted in Tess's books because I like having that personal connection. I like having a real world example of witchcraft in your real life. And circling back here, let's get back to my point. That is exactly what I love about basic witches And even about the idea of being a witch, but not being religious, not actually even practicing magic in in the classical sense. I mean, Jess, Miss Zimmerman here, she definitely contributed throughout the book. She's a co-author. Some of these spells I'm sure she wrote because there are lots of different ways that magic works. You know, we don't just believe it's just magic now. It just materializes. You know, a lot of people have a lot of uh, psychological or kind of scientific backgrounds to their magic. And I, I think there's room for that. I just think there's room for everybody. So I I couldn't hate basic witches. <laughs> I tried even. And I couldn't hate it. I couldn't hate it. I couldn't even dislike it. And I would honestly really recommend this book to like a lot of people. Maybe not a whole bunch of witches who have been practicing a really long time and who are looking for a new grimoire or book of magic spells. I probably wouldn't recommend it to them. But to the young people, to someone new, to someone who is just discovering witchcraft, who is interested in witchcraft because of its place in in feminism now, this this feminist movement, this next wave feminist movement, because I think we're in the fourth or fifth wave at this point, (laughs) just crashing all around us. I think just like Witch of the Sluts Feminist, it portrays a really accurate portrait of how you can be a witch in modern times. You can be yourself. You can work on your own needs while also being an activist, while also caring about other people, while also making space for other people. It's great. It's great. I really, really liked it. So if you maybe saw Basic Witches and you wrote it off because it looked silly, (laughs) uh, I'd say it's worth giving it a shot. Now, at the very least, (laughs) if you don't love the content, you are never going to get tired of looking at this book. The illustrations are amazing. So the illustrator here is Camille Chu. And you can... Find Camille Chu online, and you can also buy Basic Witches merch and swag from Quirk Books with some of her artwork here. But it's absolutely fantastic artwork. Um, it's definitely witchy. It's all black and purple and, and you know, super a lot of fun. It's inclusive. Uh, a lot of the different witches that you see throughout the book are, you know, not gender specific or presenting their gender in different ways. It's sex positive, and it contains a lot of really fun, cute little illustrations that are not necessarily to be taken totally seriously, like some people have been, but are more, they're they're a fun in joke, you know, some spots. Uh, they list magical familiars that they could get, and it, it lists all their little, like, their profiles, their they're good things and they're bad. They're pros and cons. And I got to tell you, the idea of having a manatee as the my witch familiar is like my new favorite idea. I'm just going to be thinking about it all the time. Just me and my, my witchy manatee friend. And it lists fun things like, oh my God, I love this one. Cockatiel, pros, tiny dinosaur, can fly, totally punk rock. Cons, tiny do- dinosaur, can be a jerk. 
difficult to walk. I like it. It really made me laugh. Another one talks about tea leaf reading and, you know, it gives these cute little illustrated examples. And one of them is um, Leonardo's The Last Supper. And you know what that means? Your cup is too big. That made me laugh. I was legitimately cackling. Cackling. They were entertaining. They were interesting. The art was fun. And I would totally buy just a little poster for my house of these silly tea leaf readings and put it in my kitchen. And that would be witchy decor for me. Same with the little bit of the pets, the the familiars. I would totally put a picture of me with my, you know, manatee familiar. I think that stuff's fun. Witchcraft is very serious to me. It's my, (laughs) this is my life. I'm not even exaggerating when I say that, but witchcraft really is my life. And yet I still like to have fun with it. I'm a fun person. And I like my magic and my spirituality and my religion to be fun as well. I also think that it's important for older witches um, who are maybe worried about not being so hip and cool and down with the jive of the young folks to check out basic witches. (laughs) I'm not going to be hip forever, uh, but I'm probably going to be a witch that talks too much forever. So I need to know where witchcraft is going and how magic and witchcraft can influence more people and young people and help them, you know, raise hell with their covens, which I respect. Um, I love all that. And and I love to see kids being badasses. Uh, I mean, I love it. Um, The students involved with the recent school shootings in the States have just been absolutely inspirational. And you can't in one breath say that those amazing kids are super badass and making a real difference and then write off something (laughs) write off something that is marketed and super appropriate for that same age group as garbage. You know, the ideas of young people aren't garbage. They're not something you're just going to grow out of. We need to encourage and (laughs) inspire young witches. And we need to know how to do that on their level. Basic witches is the way to do that. The book makes me feel good about the future and even the present of witchcraft and magic and self-empowerment. Might not be for seasoned witches, surprise, (laughs) but it has tremendous value uh, for the new crop of feminist witches and and for future witchcraft in general, I think. So in addition to my question of do can you be a witch without practicing magic i put just a few other questions to stir the cauldron and i want to talk a little bit about my own answers to this question so do you have to practice magic to be a witch i no longer think you do i did before i thought if you're not practicing any sort of magic you're not even meditating you're not a witch you're just wearing black clothes but I've really changed my mind on that because of reading basic witches. I've really seen the value in witchcraft for non-witches, which is something I was just kind of tangentially aware of before. What do you consider practicing magic? What do I consider practicing magic? I honestly have no answer for that because sometimes I'm not casting spells. Do you have to cast spells in order to be practicing magic? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't always cast spells. I don't, you know, not in the traditional sense. I Sometimes I do just grab a magic rock and put it in my pocket because the meaning of the rock works with something that I need for that day. And when I hold the rock, it just reminds me of what it is I want to focus on. Is that magic or is that a memory aid? <laughs> Am I casting a spell? Is this magic? Meanwhile, there's some times where I just look at somebody funny and I'm definitely practicing some magic. (laughs) So now I have to think, oh my goodness, what the hell even is magic? And honestly, there's so many different answers to that, that it would be absurd for me to assume, to assume that I could even define magic. I'm just one lowly human. How could I define what magic is? I also asked, are practicing spells in order to be practicing magic? Is this something that actually applies to you? If you're a witch, do you cast spells all the time? Are you actively practicing magic all the time? And the answer for me is no, I'm not. I'm going to be completely honest. Uh, 
for the last year, I've been going through a lot of mental health issues and actively practicing magic has really fallen behind. I'm still reading stuff. I'm even trying new things more so now than I have been in the last year, but actively practicing became very, very difficult because of a lot of different reasons, like my health and my medication and stuff. So if I'm not actively practicing, does that mean I wasn't a witch all that time? Because absolutely not. Um, does that mean that my time off made me not a witch ever again? Absolutely not. <laughs> I don't need to do any sort of rededication to witchcraft or whatever. I'm still a witch. You don't have to be actively practicing magic or even believe in the occult or mysticism to find power in being a witch. I would totally take witch advice from someone who doesn't consider themselves a witch. Uh, someone who I maybe don't think seems like a witch, but who uses the label for themselves. For example, Jaya Saxena and Jess Zimmerman both describe themselves kind of as non-witches. But I think a lot of the witchcraft they have in their book is very valuable. And I'm definitely going to be using some of these spells. Which sounds wild, but it's just the way <laughs> it worked out. I think witch is an incredibly powerful world, word, and whether or not you are a magical practitioner, using the word witch weaves magic into what it is that you're saying or doing. It adds magic into the world. The word witch is magic. So do you have to be casting spells? Do you have to be celebrating the Sabbaths? Do you have to know what the Sabbaths are? Do you have to have read Wiccan theory? Do you have to know who Gerald Gardner is? Do you have to, you know, know how many people were hung in Salem in 1692? Do you have to, you know, cast a circle? Do you have to do any of this stuff to be a witch? The answer is just, no. <laughs> you can do whatever the hell you want. That's the whole point of everything that I do here is that Witchcraft is so unique and so specific to each individual person. If you feel powerful calling yourself a witch, even though you don't do any of this spellcraft, that's totally okay. That's totally okay because I want you to feel powerful and magical and amazing because you deserve that whether you're a practicing witch or not. You deserve magic in your life. You deserve, <coughs> excuse me, you deserve to be feel empowered and strong, whether you're a practicing witch or not. Okay. Well, that's how I feel. <laughs> uh, you can find my interview for Basic Witches, which got four out of five crystal balls at fatfeministwitch.com. You can also find the review for Witch Sluts Feminists at the same place, which got five crystal balls out of five. I did not review five easy steps to becoming a witch, but I will be posting uh, some photos of it throughout the day on Instagram because I think the, uh, I, I think how much it has in common with basic witches is really, it, it's making me laugh. <laughs> um, but that is all that I have for you today on the Fat Feminist Witch podcast for my episode, Witch Ya Basic, uh, <laughs> which again, I got from the good place and I really think you should all check out. If you like the Fat Feminist Witch and like what I do, please head over to my Facebook page or uh, if you use iTunes, uh, Google Play, CastBox, the Podbean app, whatever, subscriptions, uh, subscribe to it, leave reviews, that stuff really, really does matter. Following my social media pages will allow you to be involved in my next uh, Witch and Bitch topic. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, Tumblr, look up the Fat Feminist Witch and I'm telling you, friend, I am there. <laughs> I'm there. I don't use all of them every single day. And I'm probably on Twitter the most, but I'm there. You can find me always at fatfeministwitch.com. You can send me emails through there. Find different ways to support me, like uh, my Patreon, which you can check out at patreon.com slash thefatfeministwitch. And for just $10 a month, you can join my secret Facebook group, The Witch and Bitch, where we do these discussions all the time and we read a monthly book and have a monthly sketchy urban magic rock. Really fun. And all of the money that I get from that uh, goes directly back into supporting the show and supporting me in creating the show. If you don't want to do a monthly donation, that's totally okay. In general, if you don't want to give me your money, that's totally okay. You can also go to uh, my website and buy me a coffee. 
And you'll see that right up in the header. So thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast. I hope it gave you something to think about. I really did. I hope it gave you something to think about. And I hope it gave you a new perspective on what witchcraft is now and what it will be in the future. A little bit of divinatory uh, (laughs) insight into the future uh, and the past of witchcraft. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope you all have a wonderful and magical two weeks. I have a new episode coming up on the 21st of March, which is also a Wednesday, where I am resurrecting badass (laughs) old witches and magical fashionistas. And you can find out more about that on the blog. Have a wonderful two weeks, everybody. And I will hopefully be back soon for some ranting, raving, and wand waving.